Welcome to Revelation Reimagined, where we get to delve into the prophecies and those things that are revealed about Jesus in the book of Revelation. We get to deal with what is this about, how does it speak to our lives today, and we are glad you are joining us for this online discussion and exploration of this amazing book. Of course, today we, we have an interesting challenge in that we are digging into three chapters, Revelation 17, 18 and 19. And we want to invite you, if you haven't read that before uh, watching this, to just hit pause and have a read of those three chapters before you then press play and be part of the discussion again. With me today, I have Roman Halupka, Peter Hughes and Michael Mahanu. My name is Darren Croft. We're four Adventist pastors who love to study, read and discuss the book of Revelation. In our last session, we saw the seven plagues that were poured out, God's wrath without measure, signalling God's final judgment. We noticed also that God's people are present but protected through that time. And so it was a picture both of darkness but of hope from a God who wants to warn us about these things. So when we come to, this, to, to Revelation chapter 17, what we see here initially is a, an astonishing thing. John looks at this and he is utterly astonished by what he sees. And what he sees is a woman dressed in scarlet riding the beast. Gentlemen, what is going on here in chapter 17? Probably we should start with the, some symbols All just right. to explain, you know, because we, we already know what is the beast because it appeared many times and we, we know uh, that the beast is a power. It's not just a person, just one person is a power, it's a system that, that is fighting against God. And suddenly the woman, well, the woman is a symbol always of uh, God's people, if it is a pure woman, and so, so, so and maybe other stuff. <laughs> yes, you say if um, clearly something's gone really wrong here, because when you look at the woman, she's described as a prostitute. She has committed adultery. Um, she is intoxicated with the wine yeah. of her adulteries, um, and. You know, there's there's a this cup that she holds, glittering gold, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. And by the time you get to, as I said, verse the end of verse six, John writes, "When I saw her, I was greatly astonished." In in reality, everyone starts off with a as a sinner, but a a, a minimum load of sin. <laughs> we are born sinners yeah. Yeah. with the tendency to sin, but basically most people are pure. Uh, they haven't accumulated more sins to their account. Mm. And that. so a woman that is pure is, as it is suggests, without sin. But, it, but if we indulge in doing things that are contrary to God, we become impure and for a woman to be impure can be that she is a harlot. She's so, a prostitute. She has given away her virtue. Okay. So, so, so here, clearly, there's a symbol, a big symbol in play. And Roman said, you know, the, a woman can represent the church. Hmm. But can a woman that is described, you know, with all these symbols attached, can this woman represent the church. Mm. Michael? So I guess we have to go back to the Old Testament because that's where the key is of understanding right. the book of Revelation. Uh, that symbolism is not new. It wasn't invented by John. Yeah. All right. That symbolism comes from the Old Testament and yeah. God applies the symbol to the people of Israel uh, that he married, he married this virgin uh, and he did so much for her. Uh, she blessed her and God brought her to a promised land, to a bountiful land. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden she started to, to have affairs with other, 
other men, with other gods. And that's when God is calling Israel a prostitute. Mm. So we need to have this um, understanding in coming to uh, study uh, chapter 17, 18. Um, and, we, we, and, and this is where it gives us the confidence that actually this woman once represented a virtue woman. Uh, uh, she was married to Christ. Uh, following Christ, but then uh, she corrupted her ways and uh, she became so, so degraded that it's very hard, you know, even the description here is hard to read. So in in chapter 12, and we have a, a graphic to share with you on this one, just to, to bring home the contrast. In chapter 12, you have the woman of virtue that's pictured representing you know, Christ's people at that point. And the pure woman is clothed in the sun, you know, the moon under her feet, a garland of 12 stars. And in Revelation 12, she's pregnant, she's pursued by the dragon, she gives birth, the dragon is enraged at her. And as we noted when we discussed this previously, she flees into the wilderness as a place of protection. Um, Peter, you, you just made the comment um, before we started again that, this woman is actually found in the yeah. wilderness. The pure woman had to flee into the wilderness for protection. But now in chapter 17, the prostitute, the harlot, is pictured as being in the wilderness. Mm. So the pure woman, the people of God, are no longer in the wilderness. They're back in the world. But the church that is impure is in the wilderness. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting because back in, in verse 1, the prostitute is also pictured as sitting on many waters. So it's it's become this all-encompassing corruption, if you like, okay. hasn't it? And I think that's where John, and let's just look at the scarlet woman before we continue our conversation. Um, I think this is why John is so astonished by what he sees, because this pure woman is now the scarlet woman, clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones, drunk on the blood of the saints, she holds the golden cup of prostitution, she sits on the red beast, and the ten kings actually mm. hate her. There's the, the irony that they've gone into things together, but I don't like it. Mm. And, and uh, chapter, chapter 17 gives us clues here and there, and, and these clues are very important. And we have to go back uh, to the connection with chapter 13. <clears throat> that we, we see uh, this woman sitting on many waters, what we discovered, the first beast coming from the water, the first beast that the whole world was worshipping. Yeah. All right, so th these are the connections that we, we, we understand. Actually, chapter 17, 18 are ju just a recap of what we read before, what we have been studying before. It's nothing new. John doesn't bring anything new into the scene, but he's just looking at the same situation with fresh eyes and fresh understanding, like <clears throat> there's another connection here uh, with the uh, drunk with the blood of the saints. Uh, verse 6, I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. And the connection that that is made so quickly is Daniel chapter 7, Jan Daniel chapter 8. Uh, Daniel, Daniel 11, um, Daniel 12, where we see the same power that is persecuting the saints and defeating the saints. So there is a lot of bloodshed there. So these are the connections that actually gives us uh, the understanding is the same power, is the same authority, the same religion author religious authority that now is depicted uh, from a different perspective. Can I bring up uh, attention to the Ten Kings? Yeah. You, last time we presented, we suggested to you that there was symbolism in, in all that we're looking at in this part of Revelation. Ten is, most people think, is the number of completeness, but in Scripture, ten can also represent uh, an incompleteness, people who have gone astray, and it is used symbolically to represent the kings of the earth, not just ten kings, <clears throat> but it represents the, the kings of the earth who have gone astray mm -hmm. and have 
and, and that's and it will come up as we progress. And we, we probably need to acknowledge that in this chapter there is incredible detail. You know, we we have not only ten kings, but we have seven heads, um, and we've got yeah various and numbers. Look. And and we're not going to you know we don't have the time to delve into every bit of detail here. We're trying to give that big picture of it. But of course, if people are interested in learning more. There are ways that you can dig into this further. Um, in those details, uh, we didn't mention, you know, the name of this woman that he has on her forehead. Yeah. You know, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and the, uh, and of the ab abominations of the earth. Mm -hmm. So that's also that's another detail, you know, mm -hmm. that connects so easily because we mentioned so many times already Babylon, what yeah. it means, yes. and what's the power it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and it, it it says the mother of prostitutes, so this prostitute has daughters. Mm. So mm. we see we we look at this and see a religious organization that actually has multiple connections with other religious organization in influencing in leading astray, making alliance with all these all these other faiths or religions. Uh, but altogether they are under this umbrella of the Babylon the Great that is a great confusion. Like it doesn't matter what you believe. Uh, you can believe in your God, I believe in my God, and you believe in your God. Actually, we are all going to heaven. We are going to be all right. And here we are told this is Babylon. It, it's, confusion. It's a, it's a final grand mm. alliance, isn't it? State, religion, everything mixed yeah. in together. Yes. against God. Good, that's exactly what it is. That is exactly what it is. And, and, and this, this idea of uniting all the religion, religions of the world in one, one entity, um, actually, according to what we read here, what I read here, it's very dangerous because it's a, a rebellion against the Creator, against the true religion of Jesus Christ. That is the only religion that you know, the Bible is uh, recognizing. Peter? Interesting, you've got white for the pure woman and you've got red and black for the <laughs> prostitute. <laughs> and we've been talking color, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we see, you know, you can, you can research this yourself as well. You know, verse 9, this calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to just Google some of these terms and see what comes up. But I want to come to verse 14. You know, chapter 17 and verse 14 shows us the nature of the woman and the beast that have combined in this final grand alliance against God. And it says there, they will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. And so it's this sense of, yes, there's this final grand alliance, anti-God, but don't worry, we're going to be okay here. Yes. See, the woman is a prostitute. She, she has given away her virtue, her purity, and she's going to make war against those who retain that purity, mm -hmm. that purity, uh, the truth of God. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, it, as you're, as you're talking today, we're suggesting that this is a spiritual war mm -hmm. that is unfolding. Yes. So you need to understand the significance of the spiritual principles that are being revealed in this book. Yeah. So I think at this point, there's so much more we could say in chapter 17, but we're going to, we want to get an overview of these three chapters together. And so with that, let's come to chapter 18, because chapter 17, you know, reminds us that while evil is real and exists, it's, it's not forever. There is a way out and a way through it um, in faithfulness to God. And of course, Jesus makes claims that are pretty exclusive. You know, there is, there is not multiple paths to the same place, but Jesus is that path. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he says. So Revelation 18, let's, let's read the opening verses here. It says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, 
He had great authority and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. And we're going to skip to verse four. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not, will not receive any of her plagues. Didn't so. we talk about Babylon is fallen in chapter 14? We did. Yes. So why is it coming up again? Just to help us to understand the seriousness of this. Yeah. That, that's the last appeal. In fact, we, we are mentioning that in chapter 14, there is a last uh, call for, for people that God is addressing to us once again, what we should do. But, but you know, as we have in 18th chapter, once again, and we mentioned that time, that, yeah. that it will be repeated. So it means that it must be very important must be very important. So it comes, takes us back to three angels' messages. All right, so mm -hmm. let's just recap. So the three angels' messages? Well, the first message, that's, you know, the ev mm -hmm. everlasting gospel. Yeah. And that's that's calling for, for worshiping God, uh, fearing God, but we explained what it means, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just giving glory to him all the time. And that's that's the gospel about, because we have to have the reason for this. Mm -hmm. Second message is, is just the same, what we read here, yeah. that Babylon is fallen. So it's a good news that, you know, everything that was against God, it, it's finished nearly. Even it exists still and, and, and makes a problem. So still, uh, there was this beautiful verse that you quoted, 14 verse from 17 chapter, that, you know, they, are, they, are, they will overcome. And, and in the end, the third, that's also the good news. You know, even it's a warning in details what can happen with people who don't accept this everlasting gospel. So they have no peace, but there will be the group of people that stays with God, and that's mm -hmm. um, we, we notice that there is a pattern in the prophetic books. In, in the book of Daniel, uh, chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, and then uh, uh, 10, 11, they're just a repetition, a repetition expansion. Yeah. That, that's, that's a principle that is well established in the Bible prophecy. So re repetition saying, look here, there's something to see. Yes. Expansion. And inspection, it gives more details. The next prophecy, it gives more details in certain areas. And that's the book of Daniel. Mm. It's uh, as clear as, you know, it can be. Now we move uh, in the book of Revelation. We don't find another pattern. We find the same pattern, the seven, the seven churches and then the, the seven seals Jesus. that are the same period of time repeated from a different angle and the seven trumpets, the same period of time. So it's not surprising that actually Revelation 18, it's, it's a repetition of what we've seen before, but expanding on different things. And uh, what the expansion that we see here is the appeal, come out of my people. That is, is not new. It's actually um, Jeremiah 51, 45, where God is calling his people to come out of Egypt. And now we see the same call uh, a, 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 to come out from a spiritual uh, situation of confusion where if you want to follow me, just come out of this Babylon and be pure for me. Peter, yeah, I can see you're busting to get in here. <laughs> Jump not, in. not busting, but yeah. We've been, we've been highlighting the significance of color in the book of Revelation. And the first color was white and it was related to the significance of the law of God. If you have kept the law of God in truth and purity, you are given Christ's robe of righteousness. If you haven't yet done that, if you're still embracing or, or involved with sin, you have the color of red. And that if you, in red, you've got a choice. You turn to the white or you can turn to the black or leave, leave yourself in the black. The appeal, in, as Roman and Michael have been saying, was we should turn towards the truth and the purity, the white, that is involved in the law. When we get down to 17, the woman is fighting against God's people. She is trying to take God's people away from the truth and the whiteness, the purity of the law and involve you in issues that are contrary to the law of God. 
So the highlight of this is, do you accept the God as the creator God and that he has the right to ask us to live a certain way? Or do you embrace the attitudes and the involvements of the world? I, I, th there's one thing I think I'd, I'd probably say it's maybe this way where talking about the white, yes. I think for, for humanity, for us, without the, the white robe of Christ, we have no white, if That's you like. Right. Yes. Um, so it's not that we are deserving of it, it's that Christ has done that for us and he bestowed will, that on us. If we, make the, if we say, look, Lord, we've done wrong in our lives, yeah. can, you, can you change us? Can yeah. you help me to, to put that behind me? He will help you and guide you into that, yeah. into that purity, into that whiteness. Yeah. Mm. So what's so? So this is the 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 final call or warning about Babylon in in the book of Revelation. Why is you know why does it come back? What is why is Babylon such a big deal through the book of Revelation? Because eternal life is a big deal. <laughs> because it's simple, eternal life, it? it's it's um, it it hurts God's heart to to lose so many people. He gave His Son to die for us, and there is no reason why people will lose eternal life. It's only the deception of Babylon that that people will lose the eternal life. It's not because Jesus, uh, God, has not made provision. Through the cross, through Jesus dying, God made provision for every single human being on this planet to be, to be with Him in heaven, have eternal life. So it hurts when God can see people turning away from the great sacrifice of His Son and losing the opportunity of their life, that is eternal life. Um, thinking of the chronological order, because I, I said before, it's a repetition, mm. and I'm thinking, uh, I'm looking at verse 4, the last, the last bit of verse 4, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. So we discussed the plagues previously, and now the plagues are depicted at the future event, all right? So chronologically, this appeal for people to come out of her is before, before the plagues. Yeah. So when the plagues are coming, we discussed in the last session with the smoke in the sanctuary, then intercession, intercession comes to an end. That will be too late. So this is why the appeal is so, so strong and said, now is the time to come out to accept the sacrifice of my son. Because when the plagues are starting, there's nothing you can do. It will be too late. So, so Peter, what happens to Babylon at the end here in this chapter? What happens to Babylon? Mm. The, the woman, well, it's the judgment, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's the judgment. See, I, I wanted to add to what Michael was saying and that just the appeal that God made for mankind, as Roman talked about, was embrace the love of Christ, embrace the sacrifice he made, and, and put your life in his hands because when, when the time comes for the judgment to be enacted, it will come in a way that will catch people by surprise. You need to do this before the judgment starts. Yeah. The, I think this is really, for me, that's really important because you have this repeating time phrase um, that happens here, you know, verse 10, in one hour your doom has come. Yes. Verse 17, in one hour such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Yes. Verse t um, 19, in one hour he has been brought to ruin. Yes. And and that suddenness, it, it you know, everything's going to fall apart fast yes. and it's going to catch people by surprise. I, I was listening to a speaker um, recently and he said, oh, you remember 1985? Now, I'm old enough, we're all old enough to remember 1985. If you'd predicted in 1985 that Soviet Russia, you know, the, the Soviet Union would disappear off the, the map within five years. No one would believe. You'd have laughed. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, you were living in Poland at the I time. I was living there. Uh, 
Um, and yet... And it started in Poland. Yes. <laughs> with Solidarity Movement. Yes. Mm. But within four years of, of 1985... Yes. The Soviet Union had yeah. collapsed. Um, this is saying in one hour. Now, yeah. whether it's a, a literal one hour or a symbolic one hour, yeah. it's, it's going to happen quick. But you, yeah. you look at the fall of Babylon. I mean, the yes. Babylon was invincible. Yeah. And it just fell like that. In and I was, I was in Romania in 89 when communism in Romania fell. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in two days, that, 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 that powerful machine that we thought communism is still here to stay and it will be forever, how well they are organized and, you know, checking on everyone, uh, every movement of people were checked and, you know, people just disappear overnight and nobody knew what happened to them and, you know, and that, that strong system just fell overnight. Mm. So when the time comes, God says, this is it. And that, that powerful machine that was created, uh, this, this uh, religious organization in, in cooperation with, it says here, with the merchants of the earth, um, with, with the kings of the earth. Uh, so we have the civil and religious uh, mingled together to, to create the Tower of Babel that nobody can defeat us, mm. just like that. We can when do anything says, we want to do. Yes, and the end will come in a second. And if I may add something to this, because we, we already mentioned that there is a danger that any one of us, any man, it doesn't matter where and when, we can belong to this Babylon. We mentioned it, and that's it. So this warning is not just about, oh, they will disappear somewhere there. That's, that's the warning for us. If we accept, you know, some characteristics, Correct. if we believe and live in the same way. So that's, that's the danger. That's something terrible. And Correct. if I might add also, because you, Michael, you have mentioned this principle that it appears in the book of Daniel and also in Revelation. And we are talking now about, because the question, your question was why Babylon is so important in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, there was Peter's illustration one time, and I loved it so much. You know, we should, Look at this book as kind of the uh, as some kind of a cake, you know, a big tart, you know, that you have to cut it vertically, and you have all the layers, and you understand everywhere there is something more, something special in each layer, and and you taste it what it is. But you can look only for the bad things, and in the same way, in the same book, we can find something something fantastic something great, and probably we are going to these fantastic things. That's a perfect segue, Roman. <laughs> Let's go to chapter 19, because chapter 19 yeah. certainly gives a whole different flavour to what we've had. You know, the beginning of the chapter after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of the saints. And again they shouted, Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. You know, evil's destroyed. So this is now the flip side of judgment, isn't it? Um, so what are the what are what do you see here as the reasons for people being able to say, Hallelujah, this is good news? Well, what to shout if we are overcomers? And, and it was done not because of me, but somebody is doing it for me and I'm on the right side. Well, I can, I can rejoice. I can only praise, uh, you know, him who, who did it. And that's, that's the reason, you know, we mentioned judgment so many times here. So the judgment has finished. And, and we know that God is righteous. And he's fair and he's yeah, just. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, that's the first reason. But, you know, but, but for us personally, oh, wow, I'm on this right side. So we, we can vindicate the Lord. We can, we can say again in, in the whole universe, who is he, what he done, what he has done for us. Yeah. Yeah. Michael? Many others. Yeah, um, um, some people suggest that actually chapter 19 should start with verse 11. <laughs> because the first, the first 10 verses actually, they are connected to the previous uh, uh, chapter. Yeah. And w when we read, actually it makes sense because chapter 18, it finishes with triumph of God. Yeah. All right, like, 
verse 20, rejoice over her, O heaven, rejoice saints and apostles and prophets. So here, chapter uh, 18 is finishing with the second coming of Christ, with the final reunion with the multitude in heaven, uh, with the 144,000 playing their harps and singing the song of Moses. Uh, and then, and then the verse supper. 11, it, it takes us back but into... You, you've forgotten the supper, Michael. We'll, we'll, oh, well, we'll, 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 come, because... back. we'll come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think this is, this is a really important thing. You've got four hallelujahs here, yeah. mm. and it, it's almost as if, you know, you imagine this scene of, of overwhelming praise and worship and brightness and life, and you can hear these, these songs of praise coming from the four points of the compass, if you like, from, from the four corners. This is, this is everything, everywhere, uh -huh. uh, in terms of those that belong to God. Peter, there are two suppers. Tell us about these these suppers. Okay, well, the beginning of chapter 19 talks about the supper of the Lord, and he invites all of those who have the white robes of righteousness to this supper in heaven, which is the marriage supper. Okay, let, let me read a verse. Revelation 19, verse 9. This is what you're referring to. Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. Yes. Now, colour is important again, because there's four colours in the book of Revelation, white, red, black, and the pale colour of death. White represents the first half of the book, the light of Christ, the truth of Christ, and the warnings that Christ gives. Black represents the actions of Satan and his followers who, who stand against or oppose to God's people and that. And in chapter 15, we had warnings about the plagues and then the plagues were poured out and the forgiveness of God had ceased at that point. The supper of the Lamb comes before the second coming. The supper is giving warning to what is going to happen after the Lord comes. And that he tells us before it happens, giving a preview, so that when it happens, <coughs> you can understand. So understand the supper yep. is the very last explanation from God before he imposes the final second coming and yep. the judgments that are involved with it. And, and we haven't got it on the screen, but if we go on to 19 and verse 10, John says, At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Yes. Worship yes. God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Yes. So we see here this sense that, you know, those that are part of the wedding supper of the Lamb are filled with the Holy Spirit and they have a testimony yes. of Jesus. Yes. And that's the first supper. You asked me the two suppers. Okay, let's go to the second. The second supper was for the birds of the air. And the list of people involved were the mighty men, the kings of the earth, the normal people of the earth, the slaves of the earth. It, it virtually covers everyone that's left. It's a pretty graphic and, and pretty gross picture that it gives us actually yes. with this one, isn't it? And all of the birds are going to feed on these people. And when we go back to Revelation chapter 6, that same list of people, the mighty men, yeah. the kings, and all of those hid in the rocks and, and, and the caves of the earth and said, protect us all. Who is going to be able to stand yeah. because God is coming and his wrath is being poured out? Yeah. And the second supper is saying, well, those that hid, those that had to run away and hide, are going to be part of the second supper, mm. the birds of the air because nobody's going to bury them. It, it's really, it's drawing us back to some of those um, battles that they, they would have had back in ancient times where you'd have two great armies clash and one would be victorious and then, you know, they'd take what they want and would leave and then the vultures would come in and clean it up, so to say. Um, so, I, I, you know, we, we're not saying that 
these are vultures literally picking the bones clean, mm. but it's giving us a picture to understand the spiritual reality of the battle that's going on, isn't it? Mm. The significance is that there's no nobody going to be left on earth. So what has happened to God's people in that time frame? Mm. Well, I guess in that sense, you know, we, we know we have many passages that talk about, you know, when Christ comes, um, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first and go to be with him. And then we who are still alive will follow him. And um, which, which is a pretty good indicator that we go up to be with Christ rather than him establishing mm -hmm. something here right at that point that comes later. So, uh, we probably deal with that next time, don't we? Yes, yes, indeed we do. The next probably two sessions we'll, we'll pick up on elements of that. But let's, so, so that's this, this grotesque feast. Let's come back to the rider on the white horse and the white horse, because I think that's a, that's a, a, a better picture to start to you know, get to the conclusion of these chapters. Tell me about the rider on the white horse, gentlemen. Who is this rider? Um, what are his characteristics? What's it telling us? Uh, I think unmistakably we can identify this writer with Christ, as he comes for the final battle uh, to defeat the enemy and to take his people home. Uh, so there's there's no but uh, there's no uh, doubts in the identification um, on his robe. Uh, on his th uh, thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, so he's the description, this is the description of um, just, yeah. Christ. And even the 12th verse yes. gives the same characteristics that we found already in the first chapter. You know, that's, you know, look, his eyes like a flame of fire and on, on his head were the many crowns. And Well, the crowns are here, something additional, but, but you know, that, that's so obvious that it's talking yeah. about Jesus. Verse 13, yeah. uh, he's um, dressed in a robe dipped in blood. So this is definitely the allusion to Christ dying on the cross, the only blood that can can redeem us. And his name is the Word of God. Yes. In the beginning, there was the Word. Yeah. The Word was with God, the Word was God. Yeah. The same John. It just brings yeah. it's the John, same John. John the is same John. All these three yeah. It's, it, yeah, yeah, it's just a linguistic connection that it makes and brings everything together to identify this is it's interesting that here we are we are led to reach that conclusion it doesn't say and the christ was on the on the horse on the white horse jesus was on the um it, it the 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 language uh is beyond the human description what he sees there so he he's using this imagery just to to convey us uh, the certainty of victory uh, when Christ will will come uh, for the final battle, there is no doubt who is going to be victorious, and we know that. Yeah. So, so we've got these parallels, I guess, that run through both from the Old Testament, where you know the, it describes the earth being left desolate, the Battle of Armageddon that we we touched on yeah. last time, um, but it's making it very clear the victor is the one we met in chapter one. In chapter 1, he was the high priest. When he comes in chapter 19, his role as priest finished. The temple was filled with smoke and nobody could enter. And then the plagues were poured out. So that when Christ comes, he's coming not as the high priest, our intercessor. He's coming as the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's the victorious one. And I think that, for me, that title is really important because it's not that people don't follow other gods. It's that there is one God who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and yes. this is him. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, look, I guess as we, as we draw this together and, you know, we, we, we've tried to keep the, the big picture in view here, we, we haven't touched on every little symbol 
um, and every last piece in these three chapters. But I hope you've got a sense of the, the big picture of it. So for you, what do you see as the, the big question that these chapters leave with us? What do we need to grapple with as we read these chapters? It's beautiful that we were waiting for Jesus all the time. Mm -hmm. It was announced three times before that he will come. Now he's coming, really. Well, it only depends on our decision now which side we take. For me, it's such a beautiful, beautiful picture of, of Jesus in this new role. Not, not just intercessor, what I need him still now, but, you know, as, as a king of kings and lord of lords. That's the most beautiful picture. We, we can't imagine. And I, I just think now that, that John is so wisely putting everything that in, probably in the next sessions will touch it, that he's again saying that he will come again. But, but you know, here he is coming. I would like to be in this crowd. I believe I will in this crowd of saved people looking at him as he's coming and welcoming him and being so happy that something is happening in my life also. You know, I, if I may, very personal thing, you know, I never dream during the night. That's something typ typical for me, it never. The only dream that I had, and I still remember, it was Jesus coming, and I still remember as I was in my bed, and I remember as suddenly all the windows were opened, as I felt just going uh, ascending to meet him in the air, and there was something touching so much for me. I remember only think I was just looking around if if my closest ones are with me, and and you know, but I remember, and that was the end. I, I didn't see anything more. I had no any other picture. I didn't see the face of Jesus in, in this dream. I just saw that, I, I felt that he's so close and I'm closer and closer. I would wish everyone to have such a feeling, not a dreams. And that's our decision today. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. hey. The Our explanation over these weeks has been that there are episodes in the book of Revelation, two main episodes, and then those two main episodes are divided again. So in fact, we have four episodes that are the theme through the book. Each of those episodes concluded with the second coming. Mm. The first one was a second coming for the right, was the second coming for the righteous. The second episode, the color red was the warnings that were given to people so that they mightn't be clothed in red when Christ came. The third one was the black of apostasy, the third episode, and the second coming there was the plagues of God being poured out. The plagues were poured out on those who had the red and black of apostasy. And the final one is the actual second coming. The first three were described symbolically with the message appropriate to each of those episodes. The last second coming is the final episode and Christ is now mm. Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Mm. If you have a desire to have a relationship with Christ, you need to understand the white, the red, the black and the pale colour of death. As well. Thanks, Peter. Mm. Michael, final. I, I come back to this image of of a God, of a Father, that is yearning for His children to back to come back home. You know, it's interesting that when the saints will will go to heaven, God is waiting, waiting for them with what? It's like you've been naughty. Mm. Now you better stay stay in that corner for a while until. Or how is God welcoming his people? And we are told here uh, um, about um, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Yeah, celebration. So a celebration, a big banquet that God is, is preparing. So it would be a pity to miss out on that. 
It would be a pity. We don't need to. We don't have to. Uh, just for for a few years that we live on this earth. I mean, comparing with eternity, how much is 50, 60, 7, 100 years that we live on this planet? Uh, it's not worth living. It's not worth, you know, um, uh, giving eternity for just a, a few moments uh, on this earth. Um, so God's invitation is come out of her, my people. And if if we feel the call of the Holy Spirit to follow, to follow Jesus, uh, you know, the invitation is there. Start reading the Bible, start understanding who Jesus is, start understanding his teachings, and then the Holy Spirit will, will guide us the way he did with every one of us and will guide, you know, the viewers, everyone that is watching uh, this program will guide you step by step until you come to that moment where you feel you're out of Babylon, you're following the Lamb to, to complete victory and eternal life. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Well, it's come to that time where we need to close with a prayer and we'll invite you to do that and then we'll give you a sneak preview of next week. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you that you have your people everywhere, even as Babylon, um, in Babylon as described in Revelation. But thank you that you call each one of us and you've got a, a, a massive celebration planned, a, an almighty party, a, a wedding party planned in heaven. And Lord, I just pray that we would be able to be part of that and that you'd continue to guide us. Thank you that we can get a Bible and read it anywhere, anytime, that we can pray to you anywhere, anytime, and, and you will hear um, our prayers. So Lord, hear our prayers today. and We leave ourselves in your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us. Next time, we've got two sessions to go. Next time, we come back to Revelation chapter 20, have a read of it before next time. This looks at four snapshots of what we call the millennium, a thousand years where everything gets sorted out once and for all. See you next time. Mm -hmm.